Uh, good evening. I think we might get started. I'd like to introduce myself, Karen Day, the Dean of Science at the University of Melbourne. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this third annual Carlton Connect Dialogue on Innovation, Creativity and Entrepreneurship, or simply uh, as we've come to call it, the DICE Lecture. Before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people as traditional owners of this land and pay respects to the past and present elders of the Kulin Nation. This year's DICE Lecture is proudly presented in partnership with the City of Melbourne through its Melbourne Knowledge Week. It is also supported by the Irish Chamber of Commerce uh, as a, a link to our speaker from Trinity College Dublin. I'd like to acknowledge some special guests joining us here tonight. Victoria's Chief Scientist, Leonie Walsh, our colleagues from the City of Melbourne, Austin Lee, Eleni Arbus and Bianca Charleston, the member for Broadmeadows, Frank Maguire MP, who is also the chair of the Friends of Ireland in Parliament, the president and vice president of the Irish Chamber of Commerce, Robert Clifford and Fergal Coleman, the president of the uh, Trinity College Dublin Alumni Association, Kieran Horgan, as well as other special guests, colleagues, friends and alumni of the university. Now on to our very special guest, Professor Luke O'Neill. Luke joins us from Ireland, where he is Chair of Biochemistry at Trinity College Dublin. He is also Academic Director of the Trinity Biomedical Sciences Institute. He is a distinguished immunologist who works on the innate immune system in relation to inflammatory disease. Importantly, in relation to tonight's lecture, Luke O'Neill is an outstanding entrepreneur. He's a co-founder and director of a biotech company, Obsona Therapeutics, making drugs to combat inflammatory disease. And most relevant for this evening's presentation, Luke has used his entrepreneurial talents to engage with Science Gallery. And this is Trinity College Dublin's outreach facility that runs outstanding exhibitions and activities at the interface of science and, uh, and the arts. Indeed, Science Gallery Dublin has been described fondly by those that have experienced it as a particle accelerator for people. Accordingly, it is my very great privilege to have Luke address us this evening on what is possible when we bridge the gap between science and art, drawing from his experience with Science Gallery Dublin. Please welcome Professor Luke O'Neill. Thanks very much, Karen. Great pleasure to be here. Uh, I met Karen in Dublin. She came to the Science Gallery and didn't want to leave. Isn't that right? You, you really enjoyed it. But it's a great joy to be in Melbourne. I'm a kind of a regular visitor, am I? John. But John Hamilton here is an old friend of mine from medicine here in, in Melbourne Uni. And it's wonderful to be here. I'm at a conference, actually, over in the Convention Centre on immunology. There's 500 immunologists over there. Don't go over there because they're a very strange bunch of people. But tonight, it's interesting, I'm going to talk about this phenomenon ca called the Science Gallery, and it's a great joy to do that, because I was lucky enough to be a founder of the Science Gallery way back in 2007, this began, with a really interesting idea. Uh, we wanted to have some kind of outreach building in Trinity. And a guy called Michael John Gorman, who was the first director, approached a few professors and said, I've got a good idea. And we said, what is it? He said, let's mix the arts and the sciences. I said, don't be stupid, because I'm a real scientist. I didn't believe this arty farty stuff, you know. And really, it's a journey that we've all been on in Trinity that we've been convinced by this. And if you're a scientist, you can be sometimes skeptical of the arts and the humanities, because it's not objective enough, say, and, and you committed at the age of, say, 14 to mathematics or whatever it might be, and you're very biased, you know. Science Gallery has changed people's minds on this in Dublin. And a really important part of it is that you get the professors in your university to engage with the Science Gallery. And they have ideas, they come up with exhibits, and they engage with the general public. And the reason why it works is very simple. It is this mix of art and science in the one building. And that's what really turns people on. The demographic we aim at is 15 to 25 year olds, which are very difficult to talk to at the best of times. Uh, and we've had 1.5 million visitors in Dublin into a science exhibition over the past five years, which is really incredible. Um, it's partly because it's free, mind you, because we're, we're government sponsored partly. But also, it's this idea of arts and science. It's fantastic uh, sort of exhibits. It's got great uh, technologies to entice people in. Social media is how the whole thing is delivered, and it's really working. And then Michael John then had the idea 
with the success of this, let's go global. The Irish are very unambitious, as you know. So we said, let's call it the Starbucks of outreach, right? Because <laughs> we'd learned so much in two or three years. And now we're trying to set up eight centers in different cities around the world. Uh, there's one in London. Uh, we're in discussions with New York and Singapore, almost completed, and of course here in Melbourne. I'm hoping that in Melbourne we'll get this one over the line as well. But the goal is to have eight of them. And the big value of that is you might have an exhibit in one that will travel then between each of them and therefore sort of save on, on organization and time and so on and, and have a network of these different eight different units, I guess, uh, each, each performing this wonderful function. And I'm going to give you that story, I guess, in the second part of my talk. But let me start off with uh, the overall concept, of course, which is relevant here, you know, when, when science and arts collide, you know, and new approaches to communicating innovation. Now, if you think about science and the arts, what first comes to mind, and if you're clever like me, you just look at Google image, and you get this kind of thing. There's one example of art colliding with science. There he is, Albert Einstein, a famous Irishman, of course, um, Andy Warhol image there. But remember, Einstein is a champion. And if there are champions of the art-science interface, Einstein's one of them, because he said things like this, you know. He said, all religions, arts, and sciences are branches of the same tree, you know, which is absolutely true. There's no boundary to human knowledge. Why should we put things in buckets and separate them? The other big hero, by the way, is Leonardo himself, da Vinci. And in the Science Gallery in Dublin, if you're a Leonardo, you're very honored. You know, I happen to be a Leonardo, because <laughs> the Leonardos are a group of advisors to the Science Gallery, because, of course, Leonardo himself was this wonderful Renaissance man. And this separation of art and science began to happen, I suppose, in the 19th century. And we're now reinventing Leonardo's, I guess, through things like the Science Gallery. And then, you know, if you do mix them, what do you get would be one question. And of course, you get this thing called wonder. Isn't that a great word? And if you mix the two, special things begin to happen. And I'm going to give you examples of three exhibits, which hopefully are wondrous as we go along. Now, of course, there's always conflict and rivalry and pain and suffering in all human activities. And you get different opinions on this. And educationally, it's extremely important not to separate the arts and sciences. And this slide here shows the way things were in Japan. Educationally, either you did science, and they filled up your brain like that with the sciences, or you did arts, you know, and they were completely separate. And of course, that reminded remind me of a great quote. This man here said, education is not the filling of a pail, but the igniting of a fire. Now, who's he? The Irish can't answer. Who's that guy? Oh, thank God for that, Frank, you've got a great education at <laughs> WB8. And he was a big fan of education. He was part of our national agenda in the, 19, the early part of the uh, 20th century. He was very much part of the uh, independence movement, and he focused on education for young Irish people, and that's where that quote came from. However, my favorite quote from WB8 has nothing to do with education. It's this. Being Irish, he had an abiding sense of tragedy, which sustained him through temporary periods of joy. So, <laughs> So he knew a thing or two, oh, he hates about the human condition. And of course, this rivalry then would permeate what we're talking about here today. Because as I say, many of my colleagues would have been skeptical of an art science interface and weren't happy with the science gallery. And of course, what's happened in the past few years is they've changed their minds. And you do see lots of examples of rivalries. And here's, here's a good one. You know, engineering, how is that? Science, why is that? Arts, do you want fries with that? You know, so this, this, is a, this is the sort of rivalry you get between the arts. Us, us scientists think we're better, you know, than the artists, and it's not necessarily true, is it? Another example, a great Irishman again, all art is quite useless. Now, that's Oscar Wilde. He was actually, that's a positive remark. And that's an interesting difference between art and science. Science can be too utilitarian, you know. You've got a mission here, and, and trying to make an impact and discover a new medicine, say, which is very important, of course it is. Art shouldn't really have any purpose, really, you know. It should be about enlightenment or about, you know, trying to understand the human condition, maybe. But when, when Wilde said that, that's what he was getting at. It doesn't have to have a purpose, you know. A painter doesn't paint a picture because he's trying to achieve something, really, you know, necessarily. Or if he is trying to achieve something, he wouldn't enunciate it very clearly. So it's an important difference, I think, between the arts and sciences. And scientists can learn from this. The best science probably hasn't got an exact mission in mind. It's just new knowledge, and then see where that knowledge goes. So again, the interface between an artist and a scientist, then, they can learn from each other in that way. And then even if you look within my own specialty, the rivalries that happen and the sort of backbiting, you know, and, and awfulness. And again, the science gallery tries to overcome this. This is a biologist's view of a cell, right? There's a chemist's view of a cell. And this is a physicist's view of a cell. So, so again, there's great rivalries between people, which they might discuss in the context of the arts, remember. So I think we've got to be conscious of all these different rivalries. And again, I like this one. And one of my big heroes is Gary Larson. 
And if ever there was an artist who used science, and I presume you've heard of him, he retired from drawing cartoons about 15 years ago, tragically, you know, but he's a very funny guy. This is my favorite Gary Larson cartoon. It says, unbeknownst to most students of psychology, Pavlov's first experiment was to ring a bell and cause his dog to attack Freud's cat. You see, so I thought that was, you know, a great dig between Pavlov and Freud, you know, another example of rivalry, I guess. And then, as you may be aware, once science begins to take off with people like Newton, the artists didn't really like it. And famously, and you're probably all familiar with it, I love this quote myself, it's a great quote. You know, once Newton figured out, you know, what light was made of, of course, John Keats said he's unweaving the rainbow. And what Keats meant was the magic is now gone. You know, as soon as we know that light is made of the, this spectrum, you know, somehow the magic of a beautiful rainbow has been lost. And then that, that then distinction and quite a conflict between art and science begins to emerge because scientists begin to explain phenomena that were mysterious. And the artists, don't, some of the artists anyway, didn't really like that. Um, and Richard Dawkins writes about this, of course. We love Dawkins in Ireland because he's an atheist and he hates the Catholic Church. Uh, <laughs> But he said, you know, science does not destroy, but rather discovers poetry in the patterns of nature. And that's a better way to look at it. And of course, that's the other part of the debate. You know, science is wonderful because it provides enlightenment as well, remember, and explains these very marvelous things in scientific terms. And I love this as well. There's a great Chinese proverb, again, which is sort of anti-science. It says, you know, if you name the bird, you cease to experience the song. So an overzealousness as a scientist is a bad thing because therefore you lose some of the magic. And again, scientists have to learn then from the artists in this way. Of course, if you, uh, scientists love documenting things and writing names down. It's part of what they do. It doesn't remove the magic necessarily, unless you're following a Chinese proverb, I guess, is the way to think of it. Now, for me then, my, how I came to this, I guess, as well, my own journey, as I say, when I began to meet Michael John, I, I was a bit skeptical because, you know, what is this art science interface? Really, kind of benefit science and vice versa. My idea as a scientist was great images that you get from science that really turned me on, which could be artistic. And this is a lovely one, I think, of the space shuttle coming out of clouds. You know, someone managed to capture that. Or this one here, there's Antarctica, you know, and there's the ice shell. That, that sort of thing would get me. And it is artistic in its own way. It's very scientific, but, but there's something about these things that would appeal to me. Uh, another good example here. This is Ireland last week, as ever, a massive storm over the country. And they've got great ways of imaging low pressure now and storms. And it's like a work of art to me, that. So that, to me, that was you know, a good example of how an artistic impression could tell us about the weather, for instance. I love this one as well. This was uh, the New York Museum transporting a brontosaurus by helicopter. Again, for some reason, that interested me as a work of art, you know. Um, now, so, so this dialogue then, this sort of dispute and our different opinions of it and so on, who really counts and whose opinion really thinks it's important to have this interface and look at the kind of people who say we should have an interface between science and art. And here's a great quote from Steve Jobs himself, and he's, he was a real advocate of this. He said, technology alone is not enough, you see. It's technology married with liberal arts, married with the humanities, that yields us the results that makes our hearts sing. That's Jobs, very important guy. Second quote here, the chairman of Google, no lesser a man. Now remember, Google dominate the world. When did it become the key aspiration of young people to get a job at Google? That's, it's, it's a mystery to me. But the chair of Google, Eric Schmidt, you need to bring art and science back together. And that, he made a really interesting speech when he said, we must have both. We can't have this separation of the two. And then here's Albert himself again. You know, the most beautiful thing we can experience is the mysterious. It is the source of all true art and all science. So again, a lot of, sort of people behind this notion of mixing the art and the sciences. And then um, I came across this last week when I was putting the slides together for this. A really interesting book has just come out. Uh, it's called The Innovators, How a Group of Inventors, Hackers, Geniuses, and Geeks Created the Digital Revolution. It's a history of the internet, really. You know? And in that book, I, I came across these great phrases. So William Shockley, who you all know very importantly, discovered the transistor, like a rise to the entire revolution, you know, grew up with a love of both art and science, and his life both the arts and sciences were sort of permeating his entire life, which is very interesting. And he was a huge advocate of both. And here's a guy who invents a transistor, you know. And then another good one is, um, is this guy, Lick Leader, the single most important person in creating the internet. I thought it was uh, that guy in England who did the World Wide Web, Berners Lee, you know. But apparently it's this guy. I never heard of him, to be honest. But he, again, was a very prominent art collector, right? And that just shows you these people who made a real difference then to the digital age, unexpectedly, were massively turned on by the arts. 
and, and the arts was probably more important than technology. And would we then argue without that artistic input, they would, Shockley wouldn't have made the transistor as possible, he would never have done that. You know. So again, the mix of the two I think is very, very important. And then, very importantly, in education at the moment, as you probably know, there's a massive debate going on of what's called STEM versus STEAM, right? Now, STEM is science, technology, engineering, and maths. Is that the word? Do you use it in Australia? You probably do, can't you? So it's commonly used to get, to get people to go into STEM, right? And especially things like young women, because many women are not entering the sciences and get more of them into STEM. In Ireland, we've got a big effort to try and get more women into STEM subjects. But the real future has to be STEAM, because the A stands for the arts, and that should be a key part. And in educational debate at the moment, STEM versus STEAM is a hugely important aspect. And here's a good, you know, STEM, why, why half is not enough? And you'll see this, you'll see lots and lots of examples of this, where one half of the brain, as you probably know, is the more mathematical, analytical part, and the other half is more to do with the arts, and you need them both then to have a really, you know, wonderful, I guess, education experience. You must keep the arts as part of any education experience. And of course, the example there, Steve Jobs again, and Einstein are two examples where STEAM was very much part of their lives and not just STEM. So any educational effort, including up to a degree program, that doesn't include the humanities and the arts then is missing something. And we need to reconfigure education in a way to make sure we keep the arts and humanities as part of any science degree or engineering degree. And that debate is, is very prominent at the moment in the US and it's something that the Science Gallery, of course, is front and center in. And then, this is quite nice. A book came out uh, about a year and a half ago on this STEM STEAM debate in the US, and it gives a history of how the arts were beginning to be introduced into a scientific context. And it talks about magazines that were founded, you know, certain institutes that were set up. And here is the wonderful science. We were delighted with this, you see. They mentioned the Science Gallery starting off in 2007 as a great example of STEAM and bringing the arts into this, into this debate. And as it goes on, remember, more and more examples of, of STEAM, I guess, in different institutes. You know, CERN is a great example here. Great Arts for Great Science is a special cultural policy that CERN have established uh, in, in 2011. So again, all these places are realizing you've got to bring the arts into it to get, to, get, to get the best value, I guess, and get the most effective way of doing things. So that leads me to the famous science gallery. I'm going to give you the uh, specific examples now of what, what it's all about, really. And there's our logo. And when I mean, that logo came out, I, I, th I thought this was like a draft of a logo. <laughs> and Michael John was disgusted. He said, it took me months to think of this. You know? And it's got a circle and a square, so I get that, you know, black and white. But there's the logo of the Science Gallery. And the history is interesting. So it began in 2007 when we built a brand new building on the campus for nanotechnology. It's called CRAN. It's the Center for Research into Nanotechnology, CRAN. And Mike Coey, who is one of our most eminent scientists, he was, he's an FRS. He's in his early 70s now. You know, he works, he, his, his area is magnetism, actually. He said, we need a space in this building for outreach. It's a great, brand new building. Very importantly, right in the middle of Dublin, and of course, Trinity, as I hope you know, is like a little island in the center of the city. Massive numbers of people going by. He said, this is a perfect building to put some kind of outreach facility in. And his thought was to make it a cafe. Okay, just set up a coffee shop in the building, and on the table there'll be copies of Nature and Science, and anybody can wander in, have a cup of coffee, you know, and have a discussion. And from that moment, then, we begin thinking about the Science Gallery. So Mike Coey gets the credit for getting the dialogue going. And we begin the process. Michael John gets recruited. Now, he's a very important person. So Michael John Gorman, he's the director. He has two PhDs, can you believe it? One in physics and one in fine art. Can you imagine? He did them back to back. Isn't it incredible? Yeah. So if ever there was a guy suited, for this job. He's the man in his, in his ultimate dream job, I guess. And he begins the process of you know, generating interest and raising money and so on. And this is 2007, it's when the idea begins. And they established the dreaded mission statement has to be listed always, of course, you know. And, and this is it, it's a simple one. To ignite creativity and discovery where science and art collide. <laughs> and that word collide is critical. We want agitation, you know. Most academics are weirdos, remember, okay? who should be bucking the trend. They should be the odd people, really. To come new, that's where innovation has to be disruptive. So to get art and science to collide could create new ideas or new collaborations. And that was Michael John's vision, and, that, and the vision was set out very at the, at the very start. And the, the term science gallery is very important. We're familiar with art gallery, of course. You know. 
Science Gallery was a great name, which we now have the copyright on, by the way, as well. So we're very clever in that regard. So it's a good name for what we're trying to achieve here. Now, we've had 31 exhibits uh, since it was founded in, uh, in 2000, launched in 2007. 31 different exhibits. And this is in Michael John's office when I visited him last week. He's got the posters of all the exhibits, some of them uh, up on his wall. And everything from gaming to hacking, biorhythm, you know, green machines, light wave. I'm going to talk about infectious, which is the one that I was heavily involved in about the immune system. And these are, it's amazing to think that we've had all these different exhibitions since the gallery was founded. And um, the, there's the building. This, this, is the, this is the Cran building. The ground floor, all of this is the science gallery. And there is a coffee shop here as well. Now, very interestingly, the coffee shop we learned about a month ago is where all, all around, around Trinity there's all these little biotech startups or IT startups in different buildings. They come to the Science Gallery Cafe to have their meetings, which is interesting. They want to get out of their office and go somewhere close. And that's very common in, in, in the Bay Area. You go to a coffee shop to have a biotech meeting. You know? And so when you walk into the cafe, there's little guys around tables drawing things. And, and that's a wonderful thing. To have. As well as anybody, the doors are open. Everybody. So the coffee shop is here. It's on two levels, and the exhibitions run along here. Uh, and, and, uh, and as I say, it's in the very center of the town. Now, the building I work in, the Trinity Biomedical Sciences is here. So we're like two minutes away, okay? If I go behind here, there's physics, chemistry, microbiology, genetics, all within five minutes of this building, which is a great thing to have. O'Connell Street and Grafton Street, if you've been in Ireland, is a five minute walk from here. So you're right in the middle of the city, which is a very important aspect to this. And at the very start, the goal wasn't old people like me, it was the 15 to 25 demographic. That, that, that was the target audience for this always, a very difficult audience to capture for all kinds of reasons. If you're an educationalist, you know what I'm talking about. They never lift their eyes up from their device. That's the first problem. Um, very hard to get them engaged. So the mission was to come up with a system to get them to come in, right? And here we see all the stakeholders. You know, there, there's the young adults. And then around this, you'll see, you know, we'll have students, designers, scientists, artists, media, educators, industry. I'll come back to that in a minute. The wider public, government, very important. Academia, tourists, interestingly. Last year, the Science Gallery was the third most visited attraction in Dublin, incredibly, right? Which blew my mind, because there's, so there's so many pubs in Dublin, you know? <laughs> Why would you bother going to the... And there's no alcohol served, by the way, except at certain functions. Um, so, very important, and entrepreneurs. All of those we identified at the very start as the stakeholders and got them involved, very importantly. But again, remember, the only question is, can you attract a 17-year-old guy <laughs> to come and visit the Science Gallery? It was kind of the thing in the back of our minds the whole time. And this is a very important slide, which Michael John loves. Uh, he can figure this. This is how the system works. So how do you run a great exhibit in the Science Gallery? Well, first of all, we have our Leonardos here. So I'm one of those. There's about 20 of us. And in fact, Karen came to one of the Leonardo meetings, didn't you, when you were there? And we sit in the room, and we just shoot the breeze. And someone says, let's do an exhibition on this. And we'll say, that sounds like rubbish, or whatever. And it's a mix of industrialists, academics, entrepreneurs. Are, and media people are in that group of Leonardo's. And they usually generate the theme. So for instance, I came up with infectious as the theme about the immune system. And then it begins, sometimes we have an open call, we put an ad out, anybody can submit a project. And infectious, I think we got 200 people responded to our call. 140 of those were artists suggesting exhibits to put into under the theme of infectious. Right? So nearly two thirds are often artists who submit their work of art or their idea. And then we look through them very carefully, of course, there's sort of a you know, mentoring and curation, we call it. Sometimes we do have our own projects. Students can submit projects as well, very important, and that's a key aspect. And then finally, you end up with an exhibition which we call public engagement. And then here we have all the exhi there's exhibitions, there's events, there's workshops. Everything will have not just a static exhibition, there'll be talks, There'll be workshops, there'll be kind of uh, demonstrations. So it's not just walking around a gallery. Very important, you have to have all these elements under that theme. And then, you know, the, the public arrive, hopefully. You get what we call incubation. You might get investment, realization, we call this. The output is going to be things like, you know, social projects, because we're in a very poor part of Dublin as well, by the way. And we're plugged into all these underprivileged schools, and they, we bring them in, you know, and that's a very important output for us. You might get products, artworks, publications. Now, this is important. We have a thing called a lab in the gallery. So we try to include in each exhibition a real experiment running in the gallery while the exhibition is going on. And we've had something like 10 publications have come out of these ex exhibit-based experiments. And I'll give you one example in my own infectious one in a minute. So you will get publications out of it. But then very importantly, you get feedback, you know, that, that, that we all sort of interact in various ways. Visitors provide feedback. Media exposure is very important. We've got a very good group in the science gallery who are onto journalists the whole time. 
and I'm going to give you examples. It's been a real success as well in terms of getting the media in get. The media love it as well, by the way, and they love featuring it in all these kinds of ways. And then you get cultural outputs here, educational, of course, very importantly as well, and the social of this. <coughs> so there are the impact aspects, I guess, that come out of this. But this funnel is very, and Michael John's vision is to have this funnel, and you get all the stuff going in and all the stuff coming out the other end. And this, this, is, this is the model that we're, we're promoting in various ways. Now, the media exposure has been uh, spectacular. So again, nature, science come into every exhibit and write a feature on it, because they're so wacky, as you'll see in a minute, they're very quirky. To get the attention of a journalist isn't easy either. Uh, the Irish Times are our media partner, uh, which is very important, and they sponsor some, they give us a bit of money occasionally, because they like it, because they get exposed in various ways. You know, press, TV, online media. I would say nowadays, nobody buys newspapers in Ireland unless you want to put your fish and chips into it, probably. Um, it's all online, okay? So, so everything is plugged in, Twitter, you know? All these various things, online media is, is critical. <coughs> and then the international, because it's, we just, this shouldn't just be Ireland. Nature, Science, Scientific American, the UK and US Press, and Time Magazine, amazingly, has featured two of the exhibitions. So again, that was the zeal of Michael John sending out very clever press releases and attracting in these various media groups. And, and that's wonderful to get that, get that huge media exposure. Uh, and then here we now the money, of course, as ever. We have to talk about money, even though we're artists and scientists, we shouldn't really mention it, but we have to. Someone has to pay for this, right? Now remember, it's free. So people go in for nothing, and that's a really important aspect here. It has to be free. You shouldn't charge people for this sort of thing because you want to get people in and tell them it's wonderful and we're not going to soak you for the few quid here, you know. So it's free. And so how do you pay for it? Well, first of all, it costs 12 million to settle. That's the first thing. That was the build, the build, the, the part of the building, you know, and various other costs. And it was a combination of philanthropy. We got six million from philanthropists and philanthropists love this kind of thing because it's about education. And especially one aspect that really worked was this underprivileged part of Dublin. Some philanthropists love supporting that and getting these, you know, uh, disadvantaged kids in. And some of the philanthropy came on the back of that. Uh, the government gave us 4.5 million because they need to do outreach as well, remember, and they want to publicize science because they're investing in scientific research, obviously. And then the Wellcome Trust gave us 1.5 million initially, which is great. And the Wellcome Trust, remember, have a special public understanding of science fund, which you can apply for. And in fact, last year, we went after them again. We got another 1.9 million from the Wellcome, specifically for biomedical exhibits between the Institute I'm director of and the Science Scholar. We're running five medical exhibits that the Wellcome are funding because they're very keen to support these kinds of things. And that was great to get that money. So off we go. It gets established. The annual budget, to give you an idea, is about 2 million a year. And at the moment, it's made up from operating income. We do get some income by renting out lecture theatres having corporate events, as I mentioned, and eventually charge companies for using the space, and that's about a third of the money. Uh, corporate private support, that's from companies, as I'll explain, who are giving us donations. Trinity puts up 20%, which is a controversial bit. That's the overhead in our university. That could come to my institute instead, so I'm not bitter interested. It's a wonderful thing. But 20% does come from the university, and the government's putting up 16% of the running costs at the moment, to give you an idea. Now, this is really good. Here are our sponsors, and this is where it's most relevant, I think, to tonight. The companies want to get involved in this, and we approached several of them. Now, as you may know, Ireland is either blessed or doomed by having the European headquarters of Google, Facebook, Amazon, LinkedIn, right, and PayPal are in Dublin, the European headquarters, amazingly. They're running in Ireland for one reason, me. No, uh, they're in Ireland because of the tax break, partly. But we approached them, and they gave us money. And, and you'll see, these are our key Google. Uh, Dell are there, you know, Pfizer gave us money as well. The welcome at the top, because it turns out the total the welcome have given us is quite substantial. And then here's the other stakeholder, there's Mike Coey, and he gave money himself, interestingly, the, the guy who had the idea at the start. These are various philanthropists, Martin Nocton is a, a very uh, wealthy Irish philanthropist. Glenn Dimplex is his company, and he gave us a nice big cheque as well, which was very good of him. I'm very grateful to him. Um, and then the government. There we have to have a Science Foundation in Ireland are here. And then various other foundations, and there's the Irish Times. So that's our set. Of, of supporters, I guess. And this is interesting from the, from the point of view of Google, remember, for example, we have a science circle and it's 50K each to join, okay? And amazingly, companies are prepared to put up that 50K to be part of this, which is a wonderful thing, because it's not an insubstantial sum of money. You sign up for five years. But Google will be the, the single biggest sponsor, 1.5 million in total so far. Now, what Google have also provided is another million to set up this Science Gallery International. Okay, so Google are very enthusiastic about this eight science galleries, and they put a million up specifically to try and help support that, which is a great support from them. And then the welcome is three million in total, I guess, so that's why they're very substantial sponsors, I guess, of the whole event. And if you see what it means to these companies, we've got great quotes now 
uh, from, from the, the head of Google in Ireland, John Hurley. He said, this project captured Google's imagination because innovation is at its core. It puts science in the heart of the city and at the core of our daily lives, showing the everyday impact of science can not only increase understanding and build excitement around it, but also foster Ireland's next generation of technology pioneers. And that's what it's all about. It's this age group that we're talking about here. And then the head of corporate affairs at Intel. Now, Intel have a massive presence in Ireland, as you know. They employ about 5,000 people, making the Pentium chip. They've given us uh, sponsorship as well. And he gave us a great quote, Paul Phelan. There is tremendous alignment between Intel and Science Gallery. Science Gallery delivers creative and innovative exhibitions, programs, and initiatives that align well with some of our corporate strategies. Very important. Uh, and the more Intel partners with Science Gallery, the more value we get from each other. It's a real win-win, which is great to get that kind of affirmation from these people, because these are the heavy hitters, remember, in the multinational sector in Ireland. And, um, and then if you look at how we help companies then, because this is an important part. Now, as I said, the main constituency is this 50 to 25-year-olds, of course it is. But we have to talk to these uh, companies and, and, and involve them in various ways. And they're very keen to be involved. And here's some examples of their involvement. It's all about profile and branding for them. If you have a place that attracts 300,000 visitors a year in technology and art, you want your name on the door as a partial sponsor, hence Google's contribution, so that's a, that's a key aspect there. Uh, now obviously it's about their future employees, they want to attract young people, remember, into STEM or STEAM as the case may be, uh, and, and get them to make careers, and, and, and these companies are, are very keen on that for obvious reasons. We have a thing called the Cool Jobs event, which runs about once every six months, where these companies come in to recruit. Okay, it's called Cool Jobs, which is a reasonable title for these things, and they, that's a recruitment strategy for them. Um, now, the, interestingly as well, the employees in these companies get preferential membership of the Science Gallery, and they can visit. Uh, they can have ideas. You know, they can have themes of interest. I think three of our themes came from employees of some of these companies, uh, and then they, get, they participate in various ways. And then they use the, the, the space for launches or away days even. We, even. we run away days for some of these companies where they bring their employees in. You know, and we run various things for them, and they love all that. So, so again, engaging with the companies is a key part of it, I suppose, the whole process. And let me give you the facts and figures now. This hopefully will be the last little slide of all these numbers. So look at that, 1.8 million people. That's the current number that I've visited since 2008. 31 exhibitions ranging from edible, which is all about food, to hack the city, which is all about breaking into computers at the Pentagon. That's a joke. Uh, the <laughs> <laughs> Look at that, 35% are the demographic, which is great. That's a lot of people, 35% out of this uh, 1.8 million. You know, high proportion of repeat, people come back because they like it, you know, and you get this depth of relationship and engagement. And then we've won all these awards. Business to Arts Award was won because of Google giving us a sponsorship. That was a big award to win in Ireland. So again, these are just little, little snapshots of the, uh, of the various successes. And the other thing to say is um, two last bits before I give you the three examples, which are well worth emphasizing. Every exhibition has what we call mediators. And these are usually graduate students who then go and work in the science gallery for maybe two or three weeks. And they bring visitors around the exhibits. Now, this is wonderful for them because they're communicating with the general public, they're learning various skills, and they really engage with the visitors. You know, inspirational encounters happen because of these mediators. And it's a real prestigious thing now to become a mediator in this way. And they love it. And it's very useful to these postgrads then to learn uh, public engagement, I guess. And then, Two other key elements, you know, given its success and credibility, it's convincing scientists to participate. And that's my real message here. It's changing the lives of the scientists in the university. So as I say, I was a bit skeptical, as were many of my colleagues. Lots of us are now converted to this, which is a wonderful thing to see, academics change in their minds, which rarely happens. Um, so really, it's working. The, the, the scientists, and you have to have your staff involved. It's really important. And the more senior the staff to give it credibility, the better. And that's, that's what's really happening. And in my case, it has kind of changed my life a bit. Because again, I've got much more involved now in outreach and engagement than I was before. I'm amazing as it may seem on Irish radio every Wednesday morning. And it's partly because of my learning things from the science gallery and how to, how to communicate in these various ways. Now, let me give you though, the meat really for me is examples of the different exhibits. And I uh, got involved in three separate exhibits over the last, say, three years or so. And, and, um, and again, they attracted lots of attention and lots of interest. And these were ideas <coughs> which either I came up with myself or they asked me to take part in them, right? And the first one that's a really was called Love Lab. Now, this is a great one. This had something like, I don't know, 120,000 visitors, <laughs> this single ex exhibition. And it was all about the science of love, right? and sex, and you can't beat that as a topic for teenagers, and you know, the whole business of emotions and love. And what you'll notice here is a great logo. So, so what's wonderful as well to emphasize, very high 
standard in terms of you know, graphics and marketing and all those things. That was on the dart station of every single dart station in Dublin had a, that picture with a massive poster. So it's immediately attractive, you see. And the name, all the names are always pithy, you see. And then a subtitle, you know, The Science of Desire. Now you'll notice very cleverly, we'd had this around Valentine's Day, you see that? It was the 11th of the second, and so that got the attention immediately, you know, of everybody. And this was about 10 exhibits on the theme of the science of love, and all kinds of different ones. I'm gonna give you just one example which generated a publication, okay, this one particular exhibit. They got, they set up speed dating twice a week in the gallery, okay? And they got single young men and women to speed date. And they measured their brains as they were speed dating and their reaction to the opposite sex. And a paper published the results of this. Now you can't be pithy titles in science journals either, by the way. Uh, dorsomedial prefrontal cortex mediates rapid evaluations predicting the outcome of romantic interaction. <laughs> Now, the Journal of Neuroscience is not a quack journal. It's a very eminent, as anybody who here is a neuroscientist will tell you. And what they were able to show was the brain patterns predicted if you're going to reject the person you're looking at. Okay? So in other words, if the speed date wasn't going very well, the brain activity was different than if, it was, if you were going to have a date. Okay? And, and there was like hundreds of general public did this. I mean, I think something like maybe 800 you know, between men and women took part in this over the course of three or four weeks. Now, what a great way to illustrate the neuroscience of attraction, you know? And then the scientists involved, who are some of my colleagues in neuroscience in the uh, School of Psychology, got a really interesting publication out of it, you know? And again, the people who took part learned a huge amount about the science of emotion, you know? Another exhibit measured oxytocin levels in people, even that, which is one of these love hormones, you know? So over the course of all these exhibits then, people learned an awful lot about the neurobiology of attraction, you know? Which of course, as I say, gets the imagination of this, uh, this demographic. Now, the second one though, which was even better, uh, is infectious. And this was the one that I was heavily, the first one I, I, I curated, we call it, with them. And luckily enough, uh, we came up with this idea, um, and about a month after my idea came up, SARS broke out in the world. And someone said to me, did you plant that? I said, no, we're not that zealous, you know. This one attracted about 170,000 visitors. It's an amazing number, okay? Mainly because the SARS was, a, on the news every night, you know, an infectious disease is running rampant. I mean, we should run it again with Ebola. We get even more now, you know. But it was lucky that that, that, that that kind of coincided. And this was all about the immune system. And it ran for about six weeks. And as I say, all these people came into it. And to give it, again, what's very important here is this very high level of graphics, you know and very high level of, of um, you know, labeling and branding and very bold statements. We put on the building, stay away. Right? <laughs> that was the first thing, infectious, stay away. And then all the demonstrators and the media just dressed like this. And there were all these things, stay away. You know? It's the first time ever that we, someone used the phrase, stay away, and attracted 180,000 people. Yes, Mr. <laughs> <laughs> but it worked, because people are intrigued. You know, what's this stay away? I must go and have a look at that. You know, and that, that, was a, <laughs> that was it. And look at that, wonderful. You know? And we've got great images of all these uh, guys going around with their face masks on and various things. And when you came in, the very first exhibit, when you entered the science colors, you were given what's called an RFID tag, a radio frequency tag. Okay? And some people had a tag that emitted a signal that said they were infected, and some had one that said they weren't infected. But if you stood within a foot of someone, you infected them, okay? as you walked around the gallery. And there were five screens with you on it. You could see your little tag. And if you were green, you weren't infected. If you turned red, someone was standing beside you, infecting you. Right? And it was a very simple way to illustrate infection. And of course, the kids, the 15-year-olds, loved this. They were running around. You know? <laughs> And we also set up stations where you, could be, where you become cleansed, you could sterilize yourself and go back from red to green, you know, and there were kids doing that, you know. And this was a hugely interesting thing to see in action because you could see yourself walking around the gallery across on these screens and then see your, the colors changing and you had this lanyard around your neck. And again, uh, we got a publication, Scientific American came uh, to have a look at this and featured this RFID tags to predict outbreak pathways because remember, this is a serious thing that was going on as well, by the way. The WHO was doing this kind of thing. And you can increase the level of infectivity by ramping up the signal from the radio frequency, you know, and use it as a model to predict infection in a population. And, and Scientific American featured our attempts to do that here, which was great. And, and then if I go back um, to this one, another really popular exhibit here was, now remember, just to remind you what this is, this is a science exhibition. And when I was setting this up, I said to Michael John, I want big, pictures of macrophages and lymphocytes and, you know, no, no, 
none of that, <laughs> you know. And I want lots of text, no, no text. You know, the less text, the better. And I, again, was skeptical. I want to tell people about it. the immune system. He said, look, they won't read the text. <laughs> and they'll be bored, and other people do that. Forget it. So an example is this. You, the second example was you, you, you kissed an agar plate that had horse blood agar, okay? And you gave it to the demonstrator, and the demonstrator put it up on the wall, and you came back the next day, and you saw what bacteria grew out of your kiss. It was called kiss culture. No text. Just the media saying, kiss that, come back tomorrow. <laughs> and then the staph aureus probably here, you know, E. coli, I don't know. Pretty scary what is in people's mouths. <laughs> um, and you could find out the nature of how we grow bacteria in laboratories. We all used Petri dishes in the good old days, you know. And that was a great way. And the horse blood got the kids, imagine, I'm kissing horse's blood here, you know. <laughs> and uh, that made them do it. And, and in the end of this, we had something like 300 of these up on a big wall, backlit. And the impact, if you like, artistically of that was tremendous. When you walk in, all this bloody stuff with all these things growing on it, you know, immediately got, got people's attention, which was great. And then, again, the art bit, remember, is very important. And, and even though that's not my specialty, several exhibits are purely artistic, where an artist is inspired to set up an installation or illustrate the theme in some way. And one very good exhibit was this. And these were like 18th and 19th century images from medical textbooks of various infections. You know, this is scarlet fever here, you know. Here we have smallpox, you know. And then you can, all these different pathogens. Here's a horrible leg ulcer, you know. And there's two demonstrators, a demonstrator and a general public, you know, measuring to see if this person's infected, by the way, with the RFID tag in front of it. So again, very evocative. And, and again, the people were drawn to these images wonderfully to say, what are they? And what does that mean? And, and of course, this was also part of the history of medicine that um, in these pathology textbooks, these were being depicted in this way. So very important to have that. And this was one of my favorites. Luke Gerardum. Now, what's also important is many of the artists are quite famous, and I, I wouldn't know them specifically myself, but I'm told these people are, are well known. And Luke Gerardum, he makes crystal sculptures of viruses, okay? Now, here we see SARS, flu, and HIV, and they were about this size, okay? And they were just on a little platform lit from underneath, three glass structures. And again, massive fascination. And we could say they've been magnified, you know, a million times to get to this. This is, electron microscope tells us what they look like. And this is what these viruses actually look like. And again, that's no text. That single exhibit got the dialogue going. What's a virus? How does it work? Why do they differ? How does HIV infect you? Why is SARS so bad? And that really generates the interest, I guess. Now. And they're also beautiful. I mean, these are wonderful looking things. You know, they look really nice, uh, very elegant structures that he's made out of crystal. And then the really serious part, uh, as I say, you want to have a scientific, if there's not proper science, the scientists get put off and are more skeptical. So there has to be strong science as part of this as well. And this is the exhibit that I set up as part of Infectious, and this was interesting. We took, uh, we set up a lab in the gallery, we call it lab in the gallery, and people prepared their own DNA with a swab. They sluiced out their mouth with saline and then made these strings of DNA. And then they amplified up a particular variant of a gene in their immune system. Isn't that amazing? In the lab. Okay? And it was based on a discovery I was lucky enough to make, I suppose about seven, eight years ago now. There's an immune system protein called MAL, M-A-L, which I discovered about, I suppose, 10 years ago now. And then with a guy called Adrian Hill, who in fact, Karen mentioned earlier, we found there's a variant of MAL in the human population. Okay, there's two types of MAL in humans. And if you, one's called L, one's called S, right? If you are double L or double S, you have an increased risk of malaria. Okay? If you are 1L and 1S, and as you know, we've got two copies of every gene in our bodies. If you're heterozygous, as we say, 1L, 1S, you have less risk of a disease. And it's about a threefold increased risk of getting malaria if you're double L or double S. And the reason is these two forms don't work properly. And your immune system can't handle malaria as effectively. We call this the Goldilocks effect, actually. Not too hot and not too cold. Double L is too cold, double S is too hot. SL is in the middle, and here's Goldilocks as an illustration. I love this, you know, big bowl too hot, medium bowl too cold, small bowl just right. This goes against all of the thermodynamics I ever learned. You know, it's the Goldilocks. Um, and here's Mal's structure and, and all that. So, and here, this was the, we projected the sequence of Mal behind them. It's a single nucleotide difference, c c uh, changes this amino acid in red, little red dot in one of these. And if you have the red dot, you're higher risk of getting malaria. And, 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 and amazingly, of course, people were blown away by the notion of one little letter in a gene will increase your risk of malaria. And they, they did a bit of lab work, 
and then eventually it was assessed by across the demonstrators, and they logged in the next day and saw their risk of malaria. Okay, they could see where they double L, double S. And from that, we had about 300 people were eventually assessed over the course of two weeks, and again, that went into a publication. With the general public, we were assessing, that. they had to write consent forms across the scientists, which is fine, and then we had uh, subjects from the general public to assess, and that's a big advantage as well. And again, real science going on here with that particular exhibition, and of course, illustrates very complex things here, illustrated in a very effective way. And then we had an artist who uh, put an installation, it was actually a movie, uh, and it was called uh, The Immune System is an Invisible Silent Grand Fugue, and as you know, a fugue is a type of very complex music. And this exhibition, uh, this exhibit was part of the overall exhibition, all these images, very complicated. And Nature Immunology asked me to write a commentary on that, and that, that's the world's number one immunology journal, remember? The editor said, why don't you write about that? Sounds great, you know? And in this article, we write how the immune system could be seen as a fugue and highly complicated. And what an artist thinks when you describe the immune system is intense complexity. And that gives rise to a particular depiction of the immune system. And that was, again, an example of a publication that came out. Now, lastly, the current exhibition that we launched last Thursday. Now, this uh, is called Blood. And again, this was a Wellcome Trust funded one. As I mentioned, the Wellcome Trust gave us 1.8 million to run five medical exhibits. The first we ran uh, about five months ago now called Fat, all about obesity, which was really interesting. And we had fat, and the image was fat, and it was all about you know, the social aspects of obesity, the metabolic aspects. We had a big session on body image for young teenage women, you know, and that was a, another a great example. Hundreds turned up to hear these things. Uh, that was the first one. The second one's called Blood, and it was launched last Thursday. Now again, I said, said, let's do blood, it's a great topic. And when you think of blood, all kinds of things rush through your mind. The Leonardo, in fact, I think Karen went to the, one of the Leonardo meetings on a whiteboard, 100 ideas. You know, everything from vampires, you know, twilight. <laughs> uh, you know, Jesus Christ, terrifyingly, <laughs> wine into blood, you know. Massive stuff on, 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 um, on, on, on the science of blood, you know, how, where the blood cells come from, what, what, what's blood made of, you know. Wonderful. We had something like, I think, 200 uh, proposals then came in, and we picked, I think, 12 of them in the end, and it was launched last Thursday morning. Now, this, in my opinion, is the best exhibition that's happened in the Science Gallery. I, again, I was very surprised when I saw the exhibits on display, because <coughs> it's a wonderfully evocative subject. And let me give you, there's outside, and it's a good example as well, by the way. This is the entrance to the science gallery, and here's blood, you know, written in big letters. Uh, you can't miss it as you're going by. Uh, you know, you have to go say, what's going on in there? And let me give you an example of some of the exhibits. Now, this is a very famous artist, French artist, called Marion Lavelle Jante and her husband, Benoit Mangan, right? And they're well known as very sort of uh, out there artists who do really interesting works of art. And they had done this thing, and they made a film about it. And then they gave us the film, which we now have running, and then three or four other aspects to this, like little demos of various things they did. And what this piece of art was about was, this woman, the artist, injected herself with five mils of horse blood. Okay, that, that was the artistic intent here. And I'm going, this has got to be cracked. You know? But when you see it, she spent six months desensitizing herself to horse immunoglobulins, so she wouldn't be sick, you know. And in this exhibition, you get a depiction of the entire immune system very cleverly done, okay? In the context of an artist injecting themselves with another species' blood, okay? And she was exploring things like the centaur, you know, in Greek mythology, which is half horse, half man, you know, that interface with, with, between us and, 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 and animals and so on. And then she makes this sort of thing here, these special stilts so she can get to the right level with the horse. And this, this movie plays, and it's the most very vivid movie. And then um, on the movie, here, here's, there's, there's a protocol how to make blood cells. This is called FICOL, and you can separate the white blood cells. That all features as part of this work of art as well. The movie's playing. And most staggering, look at this. On her body, she got an immunologist to dry, draw in black pen the immune system, which is intensely complex. And here we see macrophages, T cells, these things called, the meaning we're having over in the convention center is all about these things called cytokines, which is the model. Look at that. So an, an, an artist, an, an immunologist actually drew on her body the immune system. And that is projected on the wall, right? Now, if there's ever a way to depict the immune system that appeals to a 17-year-old male, <laughs> this is probably it. You know? And I was completely blown away. And I've spent 30 years of my professional life working on one particular immune molecule called IL-1. And look, at IL-1 is right in the middle there. It's great. Just by coincidence, I didn't know this, this was going to be part of this exhibit. Now, other exhibits. This is another great one. Now, the Irish love black pudding. Did you know that? All the Irish here will agree, you can't beat the full Irish breakfast, which is made of pig's blood. This guy in the gallery is making black pudding from live pigs. 
Okay, so you usually kill the pig, take the blood out, make the pudding. He's bleeding a pig, and the pig lives. It's like, like taking wool off a sheep, you know. This is ethical black pudding, you know. And he describes how he makes it, and here's a big piece of pudding being made. This is hooked up to a pig, you see. <laughs> Not quite, but it's, the pig doesn't die, basically. And again, that explores things like Maasai tribesmen who drink blood, you know, and how humans used to drink blood as well. You know, the Romans, the Romans used to drink a centurion's blood because it gave them power, you know. And then, of course, in Christianity, you know, that's probably where that came from originally. It was to do with the Romans, actually, you know. So the consuming of blood, uh, and it's called Black, Black, Black Market Pudding Era is the name of his company that he does that in. And then this is another lovely one, I think. Um, another artist said, I'm going to make beautiful crystal representations of the vasculature. And she's created to scale models of the human vasculature, okay? And these are the main blood vessels, the aorta, you know, and these are the capillaries coming off. And again, the way it's lit and the way it looks is extremely striking and gets you thinking about these things. And then, of course, the vampires. Now, one of our most famous graduates from Trinity College Dublin is Bram Stoker, did you know that? The man who sexed up vampires. And uh, he wrote, as you all know, Dracula. Now, Dracula is a very interesting book. Uh, and the story goes, uh, he was a contemporary of Oscar Wilde's, amazingly. They were in the same class. Isn't that incredible? And at that time, Oscar Wilde had a girlfriend. He hadn't quite figured out his orientation. And she was the most beautiful woman in Dublin. Her name was Florence Balcom. And she was a renowned beauty. And Oscar was the main squeeze, shall we say. After a while, uh, Florence realizes Oscar isn't quite what she was expecting. So she starts to two-time him with Bram Stoker. Okay? So there was a two-month period when Florence Balcom had as her boyfriends Oscar Wilde and Bram Stoker. <laughs> Eventually, she leaves Wilde entirely and marries Bram. And Bram at that time was a civil servant in Dublin Castle, but his big passion was the theatre, and he was a theatre critic. And one winter, Henry Irving, a famous English actor, came to Dublin to perform Hamlet. Uh, Stoker writes a wonderful review. Irving says, can I meet you? I'm, yeah, thanks very much. Irving had slick black, black hair, a black cloak with red lining. He walked around like an artist, you know, like, like an actor. And Stoker becomes uh, Henry Irving's agent and moves to London and leaves Ireland, leaves his awful nine to five job as a civil servant and becomes uh, Irving's agent. This is the model for Dracula. Now, before uh, Stoker writes Dracula, vampires were odious, twisted, ugly creatures. Stoker makes them sexy, you know. And now, of course, it's the biggest franchise in the world. Forget James Bond, you know. It's all based on Stoker's book, Dracula. And the word Dracula, for those of you who are Irish, is Druk Ulla, which means bad blood. So the name actually means, in Irish, bad blood. That's where the name Dracula came from. Now, because he's one of our alumni, we love him, you know. And we have lots of his books and stuff and uh, all these various things from his student days. And one of our colleagues in the history, uh, the anthropology department, his area is vampires in folklore. And he set up an exhibition and in, in the thing. And here we have a 19th century vampire killing kit that really existed. Okay, you can see here at the stake to drive through there. Here's the crucifix, holy water, a gun that would fire. Guess what sort of bullet will kill a vampire? A silver bullet will kill vampires or werewolves, you know. So this, we man he managed to get one of these, and he hates what's happened to vampires. And to illustrate this, here's Twilight with a stake through it, you see. Because he thinks those books are atrocious, you know. So, so again, that, that exhibit, it's a bit witty, but it does explore the myth of vampires and where that came from. And it began actually as a, as a, as a, a racist thing, because it was Eastern Europeans coming into England, you know. And that gets explored as well as part of this, which is great to see that thing happening as well. And here's another one. That's me. There's a jukebox. You put your finger into the jukebox. It measures your pulse rate. And it picks a song with that rhythm from the year you were born. <laughs> and I put my finger in. And I was born in 1964, and a hard day's night came on. In 64, I was born. Fantastic. And again, this is, again has a series of what is the pulse, and why do we have a pulse? And then eventually, your pulse gets projected on, on the wall. These are different people's fingers in that device beating like a pulse. So a little camera films the pulse, and that explains all about pulse. It's called the pulse room. Very impressive room. This, all these you know, fingertips pulsing and... You know, and then in the background is a hard day's night, sadly, but uh, you know, it's still a very vivid thing. And then here's another one. Uh, this is called a swarm. These are mosquitoes infected with Plasmodium falciparum, which causes malaria. And this explores the transmission of diseases by blood. And obviously, we, we, we're too late for Ebola. We had all this set up by then, you know. But you could have done a big thing on Ebola here. But we did malaria and plasmodium instead. And that's a big installation now. And, and again, that was an artist, uh, Elaine Whittaker, came up with that idea of having these nasty little, you know, 
<laughs> creatures full of blood here that, 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 that transmit that disease. And then another thing to say is the blood, tra and, and again, interestingly, the blood transfusion service are the enthusiastic provider of all kinds of things for this. Um, and they're one of our key sponsors that gave us some money. They, you can give blood at the exhibition. And in Ireland, uh, 90,000 people a year give blood. They need to double that. Not enough people are giving blood. And you can give blood and get your blood type taken. You know, and, the, and this is just a mock-up of this. Everybody can have their blood type read out during the exhibition as well. And again, it's the science. The blood typing has gone into there and different blood groups and what have you. And then another really good one. My co-curator is a guy called Sean McCann, who was one of our, is Ireland's most eminent hematologists. He retired and then enthusiastically got involved. And he was the first to perform bone marrow transplants in Ireland. And he's got a film of bone marrow transplantation and what it's all about, extracting bone marrow you know, from a, a donor. And then he was, he was a big expert on, on leukemias, which a cure for that is bone marrow transplantation. And again, this one explores the science of stem cells, which is a really interesting area as well, obviously, through that video. And then it gets really heavy. There are three really visceral art installations. And we've put an over 18 label on these, because they're so, and I've seen them myself, and it's, it's amazing to see what, this is a German artist. Uh, his name is Hermann Nietzsche, and there he is, you know. And this is a film of, uh, I guess, of him uh, and the word blood and what it means to him in various ways. And he's drinking blood, he's pouring it over himself. There's a big carcass of a cow behind him, you know. And it's extremely visceral. I mean, you watch this and you go, good Lord, you know. Uh, and very striking, you know. And it's just a pure installation as a work of art. There's no, um, there's no scientific aspect to this one at all. It's just an artist's response to the word blood. And then this is very interesting. Another exhibit here is certain people aren't allowed to give blood in Ireland. If you're gay, they won't take blood off you. This goes back to the HIV days. You know, if you lived in England uh, during the BSE scare, which I happen to have done, they won't take my blood, right? So we've taken blood from all these excluded people and have them on display just to say, wise up, you know, you don't need to worry about this anymore. So this is very interesting, you know, called blood bags. But these are from different donors who the blood transfusion service don't want, sadly. And then another great example is this, which really is exciting. There's a company in Dublin uh, making what's called a telepresence device. And this is a robot, right, on wheels. See the wheels here? This is a man in real time in hospital. He's had a bone marrow transplant. He's in an isolation ward because if you have a bone marrow transplant, you're at risk of infection. He can visit any exhibition in Dublin with his robot. And the robot goes into the exhibition and he controls it with his iPhone and it trundles around and he pauses and looks at things. And you can talk to someone. This is one of our demonstrators talking to him. You know, and, and then, he, and then he, he controls the thing. Now, isn't this wonderful? And it trundles off to look at this, say, uh, and then trundles over here and over there. And this is quite common, this, um, this, uh, this telepresence idea, by the way. It was a method in America. And it's really helping people in hospitals. Because if you're stuck in a bloody hospital, you know, you can now send your robot to the movies and watch it. Or go to a party and talk to someone at the party through your telepresence robot. Very good technology, you know. It's wonderful. And we're going to see more and more of this. So there's a flavor. Of, uh, of, of some of the exhibits that were running in blood, and I hope you've captured that. And come to the science gallery and take part in blood because it's fantastic. Now, my last line is this. So what really is the future for this is this network, and we're very keen that one comes to Melbourne Uni. Wouldn't it be wonderful? You're in the right place, fantastic city, lots of tourists, where the action is, you know. And we are setting up eight of them worldwide by 2020 in partnership with leading universities in key urban locations. And what's very important is leading universities because you need to, your staff to participate. And we want the best scientists and medical researchers or whatever to participate in each of these galleries. That, that's what makes it work. It's the engagement of the, uh, the, uh, the staff. Dynamic interface, university and city, bridging science, the arts and design. We've got a million from Google to help seed this and set this up in various ways. And then the first one is in London. And <coughs> that's due to open later in 2015. will be the first of these eight. And then we're talking to Singapore, New York, and Melbourne at the moment. But the goal eventually is to have eight of these. So the future then really is about getting more of these uh, science gallery uh, uh, exhibition spaces all over the world. Because as you know, the Irish love to dominate the world. And I'll leave you with one last favorite quote. We had a great exhibition about six months ago called Fail Better. And if you're an entrepreneur, remember, you're, you're failing most of the time. And in California, they have a phrase, fail better. You know? And this was Samuel Beckett, one of our great alum, another one of our alumni. Um, he won the Nobel Prize in 69. Ever tried, ever failed, no matter. Try again, fail again, fail better. So the Science Gallery will continue to fail better. Thanks very much. Um, thank you, thank you, Luke. I think we're all ready to uh, to jump on a plane and and go see these exhibitions in Dublin. But hopefully, 
uh, you won't have to. We're in, we've got advanced uh, positive uh, negotiations underway with Science Gallery International, and we're really hoping uh, to get one here at University of Melbourne. And we have a large number of uh, academics who are really positive to be involved. So we're we're in a, a good situation, I think, uh, to hopefully take this project forward. Uh, so look, you've given us a fabulous overview of, of the potential of this project and how the arts and science can collide in, in this wonderful way. And I'm sure there'll, there'll be a few questions. So we might just open for a few questions now. Thank you. That was very exciting. I like the examples that you gave, but I noticed they were very much from the biomedical world. What examples can you give that have been successful in earth sciences and physical sciences? Yeah, a lot. I mean, in the, in the 31, I think about a third of them are biomedical in total, you know. So a lot, of, a lot of stuff to do with the digital age. Hack the City was a really successful one. And with all these school kids coming and learning how to hack into computers and things, you know. So, and, and we'd had one called Strange Weather which is all about the physics of weather and how Ireland, of course, suffers from bad weather most of the time. So load, loads of examples. And there was one called Gravity, which was all about the force of gravity, you know. So we have, I think about a third of them were more physics, chemistry based. A third were biomedical and a third were kind of techie based. I guess that's a reasonable division. But it's mainly driven by the academics, you see, saying, I want to run one on subject X and then, we, and then we'll go with that. But there has to, the topic has to inspire art as well as science in a way to make sure that it's going to succeed, you know, so that, that's one of the key criteria, I guess. I was really intrigued with uh, the idea of adding art to STEM to make STEAM. Yeah. Um, I was curious about the success of science gallerying to bring the arts into science. At this university, for example, we have no problem with science students taking art subjects. Right. We have a tremendous problem of encouraging art students to take science subjects. Can you say anything about whether or not you've been successful at bringing the arts and humanities closer to science? Yeah, well, uh, that's a great question, of course, because we focus going the other way, mainly, sadly, because it is in a science building, I suppose. But lots of art students come to the exhibits. They're very keen to participate, you know, and they want to be demonstrators. And even though they aren't, uh, they've no science background, they learn the stuff to illustrate it to the, uh, the public, you know. So they, they learn, I guess, how to be communicators in science, even if they're humanities graduates. So that's one example of how we try to encourage that. But we'd like more arts or humanities students to do more science modules for definite. That seems very difficult to achieve, though. We haven't managed to come up with a, a system yet to get them to come and do some of our courses, you know. But the science gallery is one way into that. Because, of course, I think the only thing that's different about the arts graduate in terms of um, engagement is the terminology. That's, that puts them off. The concepts aren't that difficult, you know. It's the damn words, you know? And they, they get put off by the terminology. Hence, very few words on these exhibits, in a way, because that could put them off immediately, you know. So that, that's one way to try to get the arts, humanities people more, more engaged, I guess. But we'd love, to, we'd love to see more of them participating in this way. I guess as an extension to that, uh, have you found if any of the... Uh, disciplines talk to each other better? Have you developed any translation techniques to, to help the sciences talk to the arts and vice versa? Well, as I said, it's hard enough getting a biologist to talk to a chemist, let alone a... <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> That's very important. So the Leonardo's, every faculty's on that, you know. So yeah, I would meet colleagues who I wouldn't normally meet. I mean, a good example is me meeting Mr. Vampire. You know, he was Clemens, he was a great guy. You know? And I've never met him before. So, so it's a way to meet your own colleagues in different faculties, and then ideas might, and these are great, we're all wonderful academics together, aren't we? You know, we're all from the same thing, really, you know. And I would, I'd never met this guy, you know. So there's one example of how you can actually meet up with colleagues. And then the launch nights are very important. We invite all the staff to the launch. And maybe, I don't know, 100 turn up or something, but from all, across all, and again, you bump into colleagues and get them involved. And then this one, again, just to re-emphasize, so the three curators, I'm an immunologist, We've got a vampirologist and a hematologist together, you know, working on blood. And that's, that's, that's the real joy, to get that mix, and, get, and that's when it's most fun. Because really, remember, as you've hopefully gathered, it's only about the fun. If it's not fun, we're not going to do it. You know? so, so I think that, that makes it all, all the better to meet these colleagues and work with them. Hello. Uh, I love the idea of uh, combining science and art. I think, of course, creativity, creativity you know, you can apply it to both sides. Um, however, I have a question. Where do you draw the line between 
combining creativity and the sciences, especially if I take the first example where you use a heart and you're trying to outreach, knowing in fact that you are having a misleading representation of the heart. So yeah. is there any editorial from both sides? You know, if you're an artist, you can just, you know, to look at the graphics, no. but if you're a scientist, how do you edit that? Not really, yes. So what's good about this is the artist has full freedom to do whatever the hell they want, you know. We don't want interference like that. Hey, there's a, a, a decimal point in the wrong place there, you know. We don't, so, so the artist does whatever they have to do, basically, you know. And there's no examples, I don't think, of a scientific inaccuracy in, a, in one of the installations, for instance. So that the artist kind of makes sure it's somewhat scientifically sound, I suppose, you know. I think the term creativity is the key word, remember. I mean, you know, clearly, as Einstein said, to be a really outstanding scientist, you've got to be creative. Really, you know. So I don't think there's any, again, this debate's gone on for years. Is there a difference with the artistic mind versus the scientific? We're all humans, and we're all using creative impulses to try to come up with ways. And that, that picture of the woman's torso, actually, that was actually a creative thing in a way to draw the immune system, you know, in a way that would explain immunity, I suppose, in that way. So, so I think creativity permeates both is, is, the best way to, is the best way to put that. That was great. Thanks, uh, Luke. One of the problems we have in this country is really um, getting government and the, pub, the voting public too to believe in science. Yeah. Have you seen any evidence that this has raised the profile of science sufficiently that it becomes Absolutely. something that people talk about? Well, the government were beside themselves to see two Time magazine articles about Science Gallery in Dublin, you know, because that's Ireland Inc. You know. So for Ireland, and maybe you guys probably have less of a need to do that, but we need to get the message out there so that the Germans don't keep beating us up with their banking system, you know. <laughs> so uh, so that, uh, that, that media bit, the government love that. And especially if it's not Irish media. Now, they, they like the Irish one because the taxpayer is paying for all this research, remember. Science Foundation Ireland, funded by the taxpayer. So we have to tell the taxpayer what we're doing. It's, it's, a, it's an imperative, you know. And like in every grant, I know it's the same in Australia, you've got to have a paragraph how you'll do outreach. This is the best way to do outreach, you know. So it's fantastic. And Science Foundation Ireland love it because you're now telling the taxpayer how you're spending their money. And then secondly, this, this business of bringing in these multinationals, they love that. Having Google and Intel in is great, you know. And then very often the government will ask us to, to host a visit by, you know, top brass from a multinational who happened to be in Ireland looking at a new site and they'll come around the science gallery and meet one or two of us. So that's great for the government. So there's a number of benefits then and the government see that thankfully. And now that could change. It's always a bit labile this, isn't it? You know, and um, the ministers, the, the science ministers have been very on side for this so far. And because of it's successful, of course, they all love it now. You know, so, so, so I think it'll continue hopefully. But, and remember, you, you, as you would know, you've got to keep all the stakeholders happy somehow, you know, and, and inform them and involve them and make them feel part of it. And then that seems to satisfy them as well. So that's a key part of it. One last question. Uh, hi, Luke. Uh, thanks very much for a wonderful talk. Uh, I remember when the Science Gallery opened, I was studying next door. Yeah. And uh, I want, you mentioned all these uh, big companies that, that work in Dublin. Do you think that the general public in Ireland is, is more engaged with science than the average? And, and if so, do you expect such a big success from from this international science gallery? Well, I think what's, what's happened in the last, say, five or 10 years is science has got cooler, remember? I mean, it's, it's, it's a global trend that, because of tech, really, because every kid's got an iPhone and they're more plugged into science anyway, you know? And there's better stuff on TV in Europe, there's better communicators happening. So it is happening in lots of places, I suppose, that science is more and more popular. Um, in Ireland, I, I don't know. I mean, it's, as you probably remember, it's a great education system. So kids do science up to the age of, 15, 16, 17, so they're more comfortable with science maybe is one thing. And they all want to get a job in Google and Intel, you see, it seems anyway. So therefore, they're very keen to engage from that level. And, and what's interesting there is the technology science interface is what we're talking about there really, which makes it attractive, I suppose. Now, I, I presume it must be the same here, is it? I mean, you'd hope to God every 15 to 20 year old would be turned on by this sort of stuff, wouldn't you? And I don't think Melbourne would be any different, would it, I hope, <laughs> from elsewhere, given this city's fantastic track record in science anyway. You know, you'd hope that's the case. Of course, in Ireland, we are in this very strange position of having the European headquarters of all those big multinational companies not paying tax. So they're giving money back in a different way, I guess, by helping to sponsor these kinds of things, you know, which is part of this as well. As well. OK. Um, well, Luke, uh, thank, thank you so much. Uh, it, it's such an exciting project, and I think we can all see the potential that, that for us to have something similar here. Um, and as a, a token of our appreciation... Um, is, is it a check? No, it's... <laughs> <laughs> Thank, you, Thank you very much. Thank Lovely. You very Thanks much. a lot. And Thanks, guys.
want to follow what's going to happen with the uh, Science Gallery potentially at Melbourne. Um, just uh, look on Carlton Connect um, and uh, you'll, you'll hear more news, hopefully, about that. So thank you all for coming and uh, this is a fabulous project and I hope we can bring it to Melbourne. Thank you. Right. Okay.